Hey there, spooky friends, and welcome to another episode of the Scariest Podcast. Woo! Um, Robin Grace, that's Adam Diaz, and today Hello. we're here with some topics, like we do every week, that are a little bit scaryish. Uh, sometimes it's actually legitimately scary. Sometimes uh, there are ghosts that could be cute, like you know the Japanese toilet demon who wants to rub your butt. Is he cute? I thought he wanted to like shred your back into ribbons and kill was you it? in various different oh, ways. Oh, I thought he was just wanted to touch your butt. I think there's another one that wants to tickle your butt, but uh, yeah. So I have something like not exactly like the Japanese butt tickle demon, um, <laughs> but it is something that's like cryptid slash mythology ish. This episode, I'm going to be covering the Alp. Uh, Robin, what are you going to be covering? I'm going to be covering some true crime, uh, the disappearance of a particular somebody. A particular somebody? I mean, you guys already know the name. Uh, It's Tara Calico. You probably read in the title before you pressed play on this episode. (laughs) (laughs) Awesome. So I don't want to dwell on this whole thing too much, but uh, I do want to state that we are sorry this episode came out a day late. Uh, That is on me. In a weird way. So uh, Robin worked very hard last night on her script. We got ready to record. We pressed record. She did the intro very similar to the way we just did the intro now. And when she said the name of the person she was covering, it was a name that I had previously covered like 30 episodes ago. And I titled the episode um, something different where it didn't have the person's name in it. And we even had searched like different things like the location they're in. And the like, they were a cannibal, and we searched for cannibal, and it didn't pop up. So, uh, as soon as the name came out, <laughs> I was just like, "Oh God, no!" So it was like one thirty in the morning. We just realized the episode is going to be late. So uh, we do apologize for that. But uh, also, I'm sorry that uh, I didn't name it the proper thing because I almost always have the name of what we're covering. In did the you episode. go back and edit it? I didn't just because it's like, fuck it. Like, <laughs> so we're obviously not going to cover that person again. So, uh, either way, it was, it was a comedy of errors yesterday. And, uh, we are here now. Uh, I will say before we move on any further that I want to go ahead and say this is the last week for January Patreon push. Head over to patreon.com slash scariest podcast and uh, sign up. We would really appreciate it if you would become a patron for our show. It uh, really does help out when we have these uh, different folks that donate money to us monthly. Tiers start as low as $1, which is four quarters a month. And for that, you get early access and ad free episodes for everything we release. So it's definitely worth it. We have higher tiers as well. You can check out some of them come with merch. Some of them come with shout outs and things like that. So uh, we would really appreciate if you headed over to patreon.com slash scarish podcast and uh, signed up. It would really, really help us out. So that is the last plug I'll give for this January Patreon push. Thank you for sitting through all of them. Uh, Robin, am I going first or are you? Why don't you go first? All right. So this week, my first instinct was to cover a cryptid. I really wanted to cover one. I thought it would be fun to do. I'm always really excited to learn about cryptids that I've never heard of before. I figured with the po- the popularity of cryptids nowadays at an all-time high, now is the time to cover one. Like, who would have thought when we started covering cryptids like four years ago uh, that in 2022, they would have their own currency that would be worth so much money? God I mean, dang it. I don't do cryptocurrency. I don't know what that's Ugh. about, but shit's crazy. Anyways, I really wanted to cover a cryptid that I didn't know much about or just hadn't heard of in general. And I was very happy that I actually found one that had like a lot to learn about. Uh, some of you may have heard of this, especially if you're from Europe, Germany in particular. Uh, but it was my first time hearing of the Alp. A-L-P. Now, I know what you're thinking. That sounds like a mountain. And that is not what I'm referring to. An Alp is a singular creature. The word, if there are multiple, is not Alps like the mountains, it's Alpen, A-L-P-E-N or A-L-P-E, which I imagine is just pronounced Alpe. I don't know. I don't speak this language, and I do sincerely apologize for... All these uh, all these words aren't Alpen me learn anymore. I hate than you I already know. so much. Uh, an Alp is a creature that is kind of terrifying and a little bit difficult to describe. So the translation from older Germanic uh, apparently translates to English to be elf. So, like, the direct chan- translation of Alp is to Elf, but it's not the Elf that you're thinking of. I know as soon as I said that, Robin probably pictured Orlando Bloom as Legolas, and it couldn't that- be further from that. Uh, that's not what you should picture. We'll get to what is it, it looks like. Is it like Dobby? Like. No, okay, that's another good comparison to what an Elf could be. That's more accurate, I think, in size as far as, like, depiction 
of what they actually look like. Not really. Um, do they look more like the Gringotts ones? Those are goblins. Um, yeah. no, they're not, they don't have like leathery skin. They have like, they're like hairy. Um, so that said, it has a bunch of other names too. If there's a female alp, those are called a mare, M-A-R or M-A-R-E. Uh, and then there's also different variations of this, like a mart, a shrat, a wall rider, and a trud. It's also known as the druid. Uh, and that's like one of the older variations of this name. You know, what's funny is I have that on my list of topics. The trud. Yeah. I remember seeing the trud on there and I was like, well, I wonder what that is. But the druid, it was really fascinating. I didn't put a lot of the etymology of this word in here because it goes back really, really, really far, like to the deep roots of like Latin. And uh, I don't think anyone's really that interested in learning about the history of a word, but uh, it has all these different variations. And druid wound up being something that was translated uh, into druid in, in different senses. And so it's uh, it's weird the way this this works with language. But I'll also tell you one thing later that it's known as, but you'll probably figure it out before we get there. So what do these things look like? They're small. They're hairyish figures in most depictions. They have sharp, pointy teeth. Think like Bilbo when he tries to take the ring. Okay. Pointy ears. And they apparently wear a magical hat at all times where they derive a lot of their powers from, uh, which is weird. Also, the name of the magical hat, I forgot to write it down, but it translates to invisibility cloak. And no, so I'm just like, not. it really does. I'm not even joking. And uh, I like, I don't understand why it would translate like that. There's just a bunch of like legends that have been mixed up essentially. Um, it's said that their behavior is similar to that of a demon, vampire, werewolf, and or goblin. And this is primarily because of the powers they possess and the behaviors they exhibit. It should be mentioned that they can apparently be summoned. And those that do the summoning have control over the Alp, and it will carry out their will. Oh, yeah. Turns into house elves. Got it. <laughs> side you gotta note. give them a sock to free them. Yeah, exactly. Uh, as a side note, there's no specification on when the subservience will expire, like with a house elf getting a sock. I would guess as soon as it finishes doing everything you told it to do when you summoned it, it's basically free, and it might oh, come so after it's a you at that point. <laughs> no, no, no. Meeseeks stop existing. These things will still exist. You just can't control them anymore. So they can also apparently be created from the spirits of recently dead relatives. So they're not always summoned or controlled. This is sort of how they come into being. It's also said that children may become an Alp if a woman bites down on a strap of leather during labor. And when I read that, I was like, fuck you to whoever added that to the lore where it's just like, no, you have to suffer through the pain. Like you don't get to bite down on anything. It's also said that uh, a child born with a call is born as an Alp. A call is like that. I think it's the amniotic sac that goes around a kid. So when your water breaks, it's that uh, sac breaking. Sometimes okay. a kid can be born in the sac or have like a fragment of the sac like on it. Like it usually comes out on like the head or the face. And if that comes out, the hat is apparently like some symbology that it's like the hat of an alp or, or something along those lines. Uh, a child can also people be an alp. People are weird. If, I know, <laughs> right? These are so are weird. weird. A lot of these are related to childbirth. Oh, man. You should have gone second because yours is like. Fun. Mine is not fun. Oh, Robin's going to bring us down at the end of this episode. I love it when that happens. Um, This actually is not as fun as you would think it's going to be. Uh, A child that is born uh, with hair on their palms, apparently, is also going to be an alp. Jerking off too much. (laughs) Oh, yeah. I forgot that's an adage that if you jerk off too much, you grow hair on your palms. Yeah. (laughs) I can't say whether or not that is true. Uh, (laughs) There's a ton of ways you can (laughs) become an alp if you're a child. Uh, and also there's a lot of like things on the mother during childbirth, like, or like just during pregnancy, if you're pregnant and you are frightened by an animal, like say a cat crosses your path, a cow moves, bird flies by you and you get scared, your kid may be an alp when it's born now. What? Like, an animal like scaring you makes you a bad mother. Apparently anything <laughs> can so turn stupid. this kid into an alp. This, 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 it, it, honestly, I don't understand where all these like ways you could be turned into an alp came from. And they're not kind creatures either. They have some weird rules, but all told, they're they're kind of fucking scary. The Alp, first and foremost, is a shapeshifter and can take on various different forms. It's said that it can change into a cat, a dog, a pig, a snake, or a small white butterfly. Cute. It has an ability that folks refer to as the evil eye. Mm-hmm. Uh, and apparently, if it gives you the super stink eye, it will inflict illness and misfortune upon you. So, like, I've gotten stink eyes from a lot of people, but I've never gotten illness and misfortune. Uh, So that's pretty intense. The hat that gives it power, though, if it loses the hat, its powers don't disappear. It still has general powers 
and it can still do some things, although the rules aren't exactly clear on what those things are. It's also stated that people who have connecting eyebrows, so, you know, unibrows wow, as we now know okay. them, Rude. are suspected to be Alps. So if you have a unibrow, that means that you are like an adult form of an Alp. Like that's something that you can just identify someone as like, oh, it's not the magical hat they fucking wear everywhere, apparently. It's the fact that their eyebrows connect. So that sucks. There's a lot of people I know that if tweezers weren't invented would be suspected of being an Alp, myself included. <laughs> that's so yeah i was gonna say you go like maybe four in your little unibrow area <laughs> here's where the werewolf comparisons come into play though people who are alps are unaware of their activities because they transform and carry out their alp activities at night so if you are one you wouldn't know it like maybe you would but most likely it would be a lot harder to figure out than if you were a werewolf and i know there's a lot of different interpretations of werewolves where like they can control their powers they can shape shift how they want to but like Think the rules of, like, American Werewolf in London or American Werewolf in Paris where you black out, you transform during the full moon, you eventually wake up and you find yourself in a weird spot, sometimes totally naked, sometimes covered in blood, Hot. and that's when you're a werewolf where you start to figure out something's wrong. I keep blacking out and waking up and I'm surrounded by dead eating people and I'm covered in blood and I have, like human parts in my stomach <laughs> if you're an alp you're not exactly doing things like that but the transformation of the blacking out is similar to the werewolves so what do alps do then this may sound familiar to you aside from casting evil eyes on folks they don't like they go after folks while they sleep it is said that they typically target women but not exclusively and it controls your dreams and it causes you terrible nightmares an Alp attack actually has a word. It was so popular in mythology that the word Alptrum loosely translates to elf dream. And it means a nightmare brought on by an Alp who came to you in the night and took over your nightmare or took wow. over your dream and turned it into a nightmare. There's another kind of attack as well called the Alp Druck, which means elf pressure because they find their sleeper and they sit on your chest. Once they have sat on your chest, they Basically, you have the ability to increase their mass and become heavier and heavier and heavier, crushing the breath out of you and waking you up. And the weight is so strong that you are paralyzed oh, and unable sleep to Sleep paralysis move. demon. Got it. Exactly. And now I will tell you, another name for an alp is an old hag. And that came later on as this myth started to spread throughout Europe and people Sounds started to describe these creatures as looking like an old lady, again, just taking shots at women all over the place Sounds here. like uh, bullshit. So this, fuck you. <laughs> this would mean that according to German folklore, the old hag that has been seen and described literally all over the world for thousands of years is not a single entity, but a type of creature that's entire purpose is to cause nightmares, torment you in your dreams, uh, steal your breath in your sleep, paralyze you, and cause you night terrors. Sounds like and an that's Adam. That's not all it does. I don't do that at all. <laughs> fuck you. <laughs> That's not all it does. The Alp will not just figuratively attack you in your dreams or try and crush you. The Alp will also drink blood from the nipples of its victims. It basically bites your titties oh, and sucks your blood out. Oh, okay. No, so it's a me. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's very much a Robin thing to do. Blood <laughs> isn't its only target, though. It loves blood, mm. but the one thing it likes more than blood is, of course, milk. Semen. Which is why so many I mean, of these what? things are related to pregnant women or women who just gave birth to new ch children. What'd you say? Semen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure if this was a semen demon, people wouldn't give it such a bad rap. Like, yeah, I had some I, bite marks on my I dick, but I woke up and it felt pretty good. Uh, uh, I don't know. It's an asshole, by the way. Like, if you're thinking that uh, you're going to pump and store your milk, it doesn't like that. It will actually cast a spell that will sour your milk, and then it'll go change your baby's diaper and put an old, dirty diaper on your baby if it finds that you're pumping your milk and storing it somewhere else. And that's like just a major dick move. Here's a rule that really makes you wonder how it applies to the present day from the past. All right. In order to prevent the re diapering thing, a maid, not like an actual maid that like comes in and helps you out. Like a virgin. It's supposed to mean the mother, even though the word is maid. I think it's just supposed to mean like pure woman, the maid or mother. In this case, it's supposed to be mother uh, must sign a cross on the diaper. Or the Alp will put that soiled diaper back on the child. Praised be this sack of shit. <laughs> <laughs> there is no rule for what the dad is supposed to do if he changes the diaper because the rule probably didn't apply back then, which is some sexist bullshit. And they don't mess with humans exclusively. 
They do these things to fuck with humans, but they don't just target human beings or babies. They'll also do that sitting attack on your geese, for all of you who own geese out there, and crush them to death. So if you find your geese crushed to death, it could have been an alp. Wait, wait, you're, you're, you're telling me you don't sit on geese for fun? I mean, no, I do it on accident all the time, which is why it sounds like I fart sometimes, but it's always <laughs> geese. <laughs> so stupid. <laughs> That's a good joke. <laughs> But yeah, and then it'll also ride your horses in the middle of the night to exhaustion. So when you find your horse in the morning, it'll be exhausted and covered in like sweat. It'll drink your cows dry because even though it likes mother's milk, cow's milk is still pretty good. And then once it's done draining all the cow milk, it'll make your cow sick afterwards. So it's just an asshole. All right. Here's one of the weird things about the Alps, since all this other stuff hasn't been weird. It supposedly (laughs) lives in the world of dreams. So aside from the human ones that you can identify, the ones that are just like demon level, if you wake up one day and your nips have teeth marks and your cow's been sucked dry, you can't even track it down because it lives <laughs> in the world of dreams. That just sounds like a fun weekend. It's very, wow, it's <laughs> fucked up. Very much like Freddy Krueger. While it may be a person in town, an alp can appear to do its thing without provocation, and then when the victim wakes up, it just hides in the dream world. So it kind of causes paranoia. In certain towns where people are like, that motherfucker has a unibrow. He sucked my nipple last night. <laughs> and really, it's just an alp that's hiding in your dreams. So hot, hot. there are ways to fight an alp or to prevent the alp from messing with you. There's a bunch of ways to protect yourselves. There is one specific way that is supposed to help you go on the offensive if you should choose. So let's cover right. the preventative nipple stuff Nipple coverings. First. Got it. Obviously. Chastity um, bra. <laughs> I think if you have nipple piercings, if you get iron nipple piercings, that'll probably take care of that. What? Uh, really? I just made that up, but maybe. <laughs> There's a bunch of stuff about iron later on, so that's not like the most far-fetched thing ever. So one of the things is a light kept on during the night will apparently ward off an alp in most cases. And I sincerely okay. wonder if, since this is a very old legend, if that's where the idea of a nightlight came from. Uh, another way to ward off alps is to hang iron horseshoes from your bedposts. Not just one. Hey, hey. They make nipple piercings in the shape of horseshoes. You should. That's exact. You need iron horseshoe nipple piercings and you'll be safe. At least your boobs will be. The practice (laughs) of hanging horseshoes from your bedposts combined with boning is what gave rise to the phrase getting your bell rung from the noise that would happen during sexy times in an out safe bed. Side note, although I totally made that up, I really wish it were true. (laughs) That's so Uh, stupid. One that's supposed to work really well is if you put your shoes against your bed with the heels against the bed and then the toes pointing towards the door i have no idea why this is supposed to work in all the legends i could find and some of them were very old they said this is one of the most effective ways to prevent an alp yeah but now your freaking bed's dirty well you don't put them on your bed you put it touching your bed it's like the bed post or if your bed frame touches the ground and Uh, then you point you point the toes at the door i mean you could probably put it on your bed too if you want to put your your dirty ass shoes because like when this came out There wasn't like a bunch of exchangeable footwear because this thing typically tortured the lower class and having your boots on your Alp safe bed. And when you had sex, uh, that's where the phrase knocking boots came from. Okay. This episode has too much banging in it. Just saying. (laughs) Side note again. Sounds like it could be true and should be true. Anyways. All right. Word of warning. Several spots reference using steel and crosses and placing them on your chest. So similar to like wearing a crucifix on a necklace. And a couple of places I found said that Alp behavior states that they are unaffected by these things. That this is like a myth about the Alp legend that doesn't actually prevent it. And that once it sits on your chest, it'll actually kind of dig into your chest with your horseshoe or your crucifix or whatever piece of uh, iron that you've placed on there. Interesting. And damage your ribs and really hurt you while you sleep while they're also giving you nightmares. These guys are uh, assholes. They're assholes, yeah. Uh, If you have someone standing guard over you while you sleep... Uh, they are able to tell the Alp to go on, get, and they'll comply because if they're there for you, How you're you the one that's that under their old influence. English? Go on, get. <laughs> I don't know. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Such a bad impersonation. <laughs> I was thinking more along the lines of like, be gone, beast, or some shit. So this one is kind of ridiculous, but it's actually like the nicest part, I think, of the Alp legend. If you wake up and there's an alp sitting on your chest and you have the ability to speak during your sleep paralysis, which is very rare, you should offer to let him borrow something of yours or ask him if he wants to have coffee in the morning. 
I know this sounds like some bullshit that I made up, but this is actually in the legend. If you oh. ask him that and he has something he wants to borrow from you, he'll agree and he'll leave. Or they will. I mean, if it's an, uh, if it's a mare, then she'll agree. If you ask it to have coffee with you, they make it sound like it basically just runs out the door. Like this thing wants to have a cup of coffee with you and he'll come back in the morning. Uh, okay. And like he'll sit there and you'll have an awkward morning like cup of coffee, but he'll leave you be. And there's no telling about how long he'll leave you be because they do come back. Uh, but that's apparently supposed to work, like sharing a cup of coffee with this thing in the morning. It's just like, all right, cool. I'll be back. You want me to bring Starbucks? What do you want? Caramel macchiato with five shots? Sure. Mm, me this morning. You're all about those five shots. Probably going to be me tomorrow, too. So I mentioned earlier, uh, if its hat gets knocked off, it still has its powers. If you somehow are able to get a hold of the Alps hat. Can I wear it? Oh, that's a fucking good question. If I found an Alp hat. Can I become magical? I would probably put it on, but I'm pretty sure it's going to turn you into an Alp. So... Well, I mean, okay, these those... things are tiny, though, right? So think of putting that tiny little hat on your head. <laughs> you look like, hilarious. But, like, great. when you transform into an alp and you shrink, does the hat shrink? So is it a regular size hat for a person when they're not in alp form? Or does it appear as you transform? I don't know. These are questions that we'll have to ask. <laughs> but if you get a hold of this alp hat, it'll basically make a deal with you to try and get it back. It won't attack you. It'll try and – but it'll make a deal to try and get this thing back. Um the coffee one is said to be a lock. The Alp will eventually come back. And it's stated that when they do come back, they're even meaner the second time. So if you find a way to drive it away, you're kind of going to have to deal with him again later on. As far as going on the offensive against an Alp, there is supposedly a way to trap an Alp. So you can employ this method as a way to prevent them from getting in. And likewise, if they have gotten in from getting out, you basically have to seal up your house including all your windows, all your doors, and all your keyholes. Obviously, this is part of the older myth because we don't really have keyholes anymore, but... Uh, you still have keyholes. I mean, not really. How do you like, put you your You don't have a keyhole key that goes door. all the way through your door where you can, like, peek in. You know what I mean? Like, that's what it means with a keyhole. Because it, like, would go through to the other side where you can, like, look through and it would be something that this Alp could, like, manage to get their way through to get into your home. It could work. A lot of newer doors <laughs> don't have those type of keyholes, but... <laughs> If you have one, you have to seal that up, too. If the Alp is already on the inside and you finish sealing your house, they're trapped. And there's a story about trapping an Alp that I'll tell you right now. Okay. This is an actual, like, parable story about an Alp. I've updated the verbiage so it makes sense in today's times. So there were these two bros that were roommates, all right? Mm -hmm. cool, cool, cool. One of them kept having awful nightmares. And one morning he said, yo, dog. Pretty sure there's an Alp coming in in the night and sitting on my chest and doing this to me. So his friend says, hear me out. We seal the house up good and tight. I'll stand guard in the night. When the Alp shows up, I'll seal the last keyhole in the house and we'll trap it. And bro number one says, bet. Wow. And then they shotgun beers and crush the empties on their heads. It's a long time ago. So they were either in bottles or steins. So you know, these bros are hardcore. They seal up the house except for one of the doors, and bro number one goes to sleep. Bro number two lays there, pretending to sleep, and watches. And after a while, he sees the Alp come in and sit on bro number one's chest. So the Alp is preoccupied, putting nightmares into bro one's sleep. So bro two sneaks off, seals the keyhole on the last door. The Alp is like, oh, what the fuck? And apparently just disappears. So the part of this, this part of the story is not very clear. The Alp is basically like defeated and trapped. But it vanishes. So the bros high five, the chest bump, they shotgun a few more brews, celebrate defeating Obviously, the Alp. Obviously, bro number one is possessed. They go to sleep and they wake up in the morning. When they wake up in the morning, according to the story, they see a smoking hot chick behind the stove cooking breakfast. No, they don't. Yes, this is the story. Turns out, in this case, the Alp was actually a human. So when she transformed, went into the house and became trapped. She had to wait until morning to revert back to her original form. The story states that these bros started arguing over which one of them now owns her. Wow. <laughs> and this after is debating for a while, awful. they almost come to blows and they decide bro one because he was the one who had been the victim of the target is the owner. And so once that's decided between you the don't bros. own me. <laughs> and once that's decided between the bros, obviously the next step is bro one 
and this woman get married and have kids. That's so dumb. How they accomplish this without leaving the house, I don't know. It sounds in this case that once the door is sealed, the Alp can't be free of the captors until the keyhole is unblocked. So, like, I guess they can still open the door and she's still bound to him. But the Alp basically has no clue which door it was that they came in. Because if they can find the door that it came in and unblock it, they can leave. So maybe when they went out, bro number two, like, hid the door or something. It's silly. But after getting married and having kids, after all these years, the Alp keeps asking to see the keyhole. And bro number one is like, no, I'm not going to show you. Stop asking. I'm playing Madden. And the Alp says, like, but babe, my mom needs help with the farm. I haven't been home in, like, a super long time. Like, we got married and we have kids. And bro number one's heart grows three sizes that day. And he decides he's going to show her the lock. So as soon as she sees the lock, she pokes out the straw that had been used to jam it and disappears and is never seen again. In the updated wow. version, I like to think she that she packs her bags. Support. That's <laughs> I like to think that she packs her bags and leaves, telling him no one owns her, and then she takes the kids with her because they're probably better off anyways. You'd be shocked how much of that story I just told you follows the actual telling in Poland and Germany in particular. There's a variation in other parts of Europe where the Alp is a cat that comes in at midnight and not a woman. And when it comes in, the friend nails the cat's paw to the ground. And then in the morning, she's turned into a beautiful woman. And all the versions of the story, regardless of what form the Alp takes, basically the middle and the end are she turns into a beautiful woman. She gets married. She has kids. She finds the keyhole. She leaves forever. So when it comes to Alps, I suggest nightlights and sealing up your house. Get rid of any doors that have actual keyholes that like go all the way through. It's not good for sealing your house from like weather in the first place the shoes at the foot of the bed seems pretty non-intrusive and low maintenance too i don't know if it works with slippies but that would totally make sense because i mean like if you get out of bed and the floor is cold having some slippies right there would be really convenient maybe you can pull off having an awkward cup of coffee to avoid awful sleep and horrific nightmares if that fails but that should be a fallback plan i've never heard of any of this by the way when it comes to old hag syndrome so if anyone sees her or any of these alps remember these steps and let us know if they work and that, my spooky friends, is the Alp. Nice. Thank you for that entertaining tale. You're welcome. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, before we get to Robin's side of the episode, we're going to take a quick commercial break. Welcome back to my half of the episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that little uh, commercial break because it's about to get real depressing up in here. Oh, God. So Adam had the fun topic, and I'm going to do a true crime. It's a true crime kind of week for me. And uh, I'm going to be telling you about the disappearance of a young woman from Bella, New Mexico. Um, we're going to stay out here in the U.S. I think it's been a while since I've covered, I don't know. All the weeks are blending together for me. I've been We doing... haven't done a disappearance in a while, so. Okay. Yeah, in the U.S., depressing, horrible disappearances like this one are far too common. Um, the one I'm going to be telling you guys about is Tara Lay or Lee, Tara Lee Calico. She was born February 28th, 1969 in New Mexico. Uh, Tara was one of six children. Her parents were David and Patty Calico. Her parents separated when she was younger. And uh, her mother remarried, turned into Patty Dole, and she took Tara with her. Um, but they didn't move very far. They moved to, like, a nearby suburb from where she lived before. Uh, growing up, Tara was described as being fiercely independent, organized, and outgoing. She was athletic. She was energetic. Uh, the older she got, that kind of just grew even more. And she was the lover. She was the lover. She was a lover of outdoors. She was always up for an adventure. She loved to go hiking and biking, things like that. Uh, making friends was kind of like second nature for her. And she did well in high school. And that success in high school kind of carried over to her first year in college. Uh, she went to school at the University of New Mexico, where she decided to study psychology. Um, she enjoyed psychology. She enjoyed learning about people. She was a really, a, a big people person, apparently. And her passion showed in her work. She maintained a 3.9 GPA in her first Damn. year of college. Um, I mean, so did I. And then I graduated with like a 3.2. Shit happens. Okay. <laughs> C's get degrees. <laughs> uh, you could say that from the outside, she seemed like an all American girl next door type. Um, she kept what seemed to be a good balance between life and school. She was 
dating her former high school classmate, Jack Cole, um, and they had a seemingly good relationship. They went on adventures together, they got along, and she somehow made life work between school, work, love, self-care, etc., etc. Um, it seemed like she really had her shit together. And that these days, that's really hard to do. So kudos. I was going to say, I feel like that's like really hard to do regardless of the time period, but it might have been even harder back then. Mm, that's true. That was until September 20th, 1988, when things took a turn. So it was a few weeks into her second year of university, and she still lived at home with her mom. And the two kind of had a routine. They they did stuff together. They had a really good relationship with each other. Um, they knew if something was wrong, right? Because they were just so used to having each other around. Tara was getting ready for her daily bike ride early that morning. And it was normal for her to go on this 36-mile bike ride along Highway 47 with her mother. They would do it together. Um, this particular morning, Patty decides to stay home. But Tara left at her usual time at around 9.30 in the morning. It wasn't an especially early morning. Um, 9.30 seems like a typical start time, right? Maybe your mom would be like, no, that's too late. The sun's out. It's hot. Yeah. I mean, we are in Vegas, though. So This particular... Well, this is New Mexico. I'm sure it's just as hot. Oh, yeah. That's a good point. Um, this particular morning, she's riding her mother's bright pink Huffy mountain bike as her own bike had a flat tire at the time. Uh, before Tara left, she had told her mother to come grab her in the car if she wasn't back by noon. Her mother advised her to think about carrying some mace with her, but Tara rejects um, the idea of carrying mace. Tara had a tennis date planned with her boyfriend, Jack, at 12.30 p.m., and then she had class at 3.30, so she had plans for her day. While on her bike ride, she rode with a Walkman, which, you know... You got to remember this is 1988. We don't got iPads yet. For those of you young folks who don't know what a Walkman is, see Guardians of the player. Galaxy and the thing that he yeah. listens to music on. Yeah, cassette player. So before she leaves, she asks her mom to rewind two tapes for her for her bike ride. Uh, yes, cassette tapes. And the fact that her mom would do this for her, I think, is very sweet um, because that shit is annoying. Also, why don't you just listen to the other side of the tape? Come on. Really? Because if you listen to the other side of the tape, then you just flip it. It's rewound. Well, it's like a 30-something mile bike ride. Maybe she has the song she starts with and she needs to get into her groove through like ah, side okay, A. Okay, and okay. then like she takes a break, takes a sip of water, flips to side B. I mean, people that like, go on bike rides have like a very loyal routine, as we know, because my mom goes on so many bike rides. All right. So uh, continuing on, Patty waits for Tara. But when she didn't come back, she did as planned, and she hopped into the car and went to go look for her. The route that she takes, the 36-mile route, is pretty, it's like a straight shot to the end. So the end is a railroad track. She drives down, doesn't see Tara at all on this straight shot towards the railroad track. Um, understandably, the mom starts to call around to hospitals. She is desperate to find her daughter, thinking that maybe she ended up at the hospital after being in an accident. Um, after searching, she comes up with nothing. She's not at any of these hospitals. And the next step was to round up friends and family to try and help look for her. Even as a group, they couldn't find, they couldn't find any trace of her. So then they brought in police involvement. So that day, police began to search for her, um, but have no luck finding her. Um, and then night falls, officers halt the search and state that they're going to resume searching in the morning. As horrible luck would have it, that night a heavy rain comes in and may have washed away any evidence that could have possibly been found um, if that hadn't happened. The next morning, the search resumes only for the only evidence to really be found being a set of bike tracks and the bike tracks look like they're veering off of the road suddenly and it's about a hundred yards away from the highway which is 300 feet which is like what 10 meters or some shit 100 meters correct and it's you know, like a yeah. yard is almost a meter so a yard is also 100 meters just about it's probably like little. 98 meters or something all right so 
When walking around, police are told by witnesses that they had seen Tara riding northbound on the highway back towards her home at around 11.30 a.m. Um, she was only about two miles away from home when they saw her. Uh, another witness claims to have seen a 1953 Ford pickup truck. Uh, it was dirty white or light gray in color with a white homemade shell. I'm assuming that's like the camper that goes on the back, maybe. Um, it seemed like the truck was following closely behind her on the shoulder. And it was noted that Tara had had headphones on, oblivious to the truck behind her. I would like to point out, like, if you guys are walking around don't have your headphones on to the point where you cannot hear anything around you because that is so dangerous. Absolutely. I think that I have my headphones in sometimes when I walk around and they're off or they're really, really low. And normally it's just because like, I don't want to like get kidnapped. Not exactly get kidnapped. Is what I'm trying to say is like, I don't want to like bump into someone or cause a dangerous situation. And, uh, it is something to be very aware of, though. Like, if you make yourself oblivious to the world, it, it puts you in a very vulnerable state. Yeah. I mean, um, maybe someone's yelling at you, you know, you're about to get hit by something, right? And someone's screaming at you, but you can't hear anything. Um, that's it, it worries me when I hear someone else. If I can hear your headphones, they're too loud, you know? Um, Unless you're at the gym and you're sitting next to me on the other bike. And I mean, get off my back at that point. I'm trying to distract myself from the fact that I hate cardio. <laughs> They are too loud. All right. So a third witness had driven past Tara at one point and also remembered seeing the white truck, but added that they'd seen multiple individuals in the truck. Further investigation found several footprints. Upon following these footprints, they discover a tape from her Walkman and then some plastic shards, possibly from that very Walkman. Uh, along with some empty beer cans. Fuck, that's such a bad sign. They find the rest of her Walkman 19 miles away from the highway at the John F. Kennedy campground at the base of the Manzano Mountains. And this area was fairly remote and fairly unpopulated. Um, this discovery led to the belief that she had, in fact, been abducted. Supposedly, police efforts doubled, though her mother thought otherwise. Because it's her daughter, you know. Of course, she's going to be like, it's not enough. Um, but maybe it wasn't, which we'll get into later. So, Patty claims that an officer in particular would call her often with some fairly gruesome theories on what could have possibly happened. Um, some of these theories included her having been a part of some uh, satanic cult ritual sacrifice. Uh, obviously, these things were like traumatizing for a mother to hear, right? Why wouldn't it be? Why? But why is this officer going out of his way to do this to her? You said this was in the 80s, right? Yeah. It, it, she disappeared in 88? Yeah, like right, right in satanic panic. Okay. He even told a reporter that it was likely that Tara had actually run away, which is fucked up. This detective no longer works for that police department. Other evidence they picked up included a water bottle, some disturbed dirt nearby, and they even looked into three men that had been drinking beer in the back of a pickup truck. These men were eliminated as suspects, uh, though I'm not exactly sure how they had eliminated them, but, but they weren't the ones that did it, apparently. Police released uh, two sketches based on witness testimonies. The sketches were of the occupants of the truck. The driver looked to be older, like later 30s to mid 40s, uh, Caucasian, red hair, tall with wrinkles near his temple. And then the other passenger would, was described as being a younger Caucasian male. Uh, Tara's disappearance in broad daylight is a mystery. Even with several witnesses, there isn't enough evidence to nail down who may have been behind her disappearance. Uh, the search, which included the assistance of a helicopter, ended on September 27th, a week after it began. And the case eventually went cold without any more evidence, right? A year later, on June 15th, 1989, about 1,700 miles away from the area of the initial disappearance in Port St. Joe, Florida, a Polaroid photo is found and a woman finds it in an empty parking lot of a convenience store. In this photo were two individuals, a boy and a girl, both were bound with black tape over their mouths in the back of a van. 
where the photo was found, it was reported that a white Toyota van had been parked there for some time. And the woman calls the police, who then pass this photo off to the FBI. The FBI, in turn, releases the photograph to local media. Relatives of Patty's contact her, claiming that the woman looked a lot like Tara. And if you look at photos of the two, like the photo um, with the girl that's bound and the photo um, that is often circulated of Tara, they do look very similar. Patty flew down to Florida to look at the photo in person. The girl in the photo bore a striking resemblance to Tara. What made her even more convinced was the scar on the girl's leg in the photo. Tara had a scar on her leg in that exact same spot um, because when she was a kid, she suffered from a car accident. So growing up, obviously, the mom knows what her kid looks like and the scars that her daughter has. Uh, Apparently in the photo was also a copy of one of Tara's favorite books, um, My Sweet Audrina by V.C. Andrews. Despite various agencies examining the photo, it was impossible for them to definitively uh, definitively conclude that the woman in the photo was, in fact, Tara. Um, in August of 1989, the FBI announced that they couldn't confirm the identity of the girl in the photo. Later on, two other photos are found. One photo in Montecito, California, at a construction site. It's a blurry picture of a woman's face with tape over her mouth. The girl had a similar hairline to Tara's. She even had a lazy pupil in one eye like Tara. There was some light blue striped fabric in the photos uh, behind the woman as well, similar to that found in the previous photo in the van. Um, Patty believed that it was Tara, but the Polaroid film that it was taken on wasn't available until 1989. Uh, Another photo was found of a woman on an Amtrak train. She was sitting next to a man and she was lightly tied with gauze as well as having like gauze around her eyes. But this particular film material wasn't made available until 1990. And Patty was not convinced at all that this particular photo was Tara. It seems more like maybe artsy with the, the way she's bound with the gauze and stuff. Who knows? Um, I can't say. None of the above individuals in these photos have ever been, like, definitively identified. Um, There was a family who did think that the boy in the first photo was Michael Henley, who had disappeared in April of 1988. Henley's mother was almost certain that it was him. But that being said, it's considered unlikely because his remains were discovered in June of 1990 in the Zuni Mountains. And where he was discovered was seven miles away from the family's campsite from where he disappeared. And it was 75 miles away from where Tara disappeared. So they, I mean, authorities just think that Henley got lost and died of exposure as opposed to being kidnapped. Right. Um, but you never know. Apparently, a freedom of information request was made for police re- uh, records about Tara's case. When the files were received, they were a mess. Um, it was all disorganized, not at all cataloged. Um, it was even missing documents and pieces of evidence. Like, there were audio recordings and interviews that had been logged as evidence, but were not at all in with the police records. Um, Patty was absolutely disappointed in the various law enforcement agencies and their inability to find anything about what happened to Tara. She thought that there was something going on with all of it, and that it didn't make sense that with all this quote-unquote effort, they weren't able to pull up anything, you know? I wonder how often, like, high-profile cases like this are the result of just disorganization and possible negligence, where it's the exception. It's not the rule. That's why things like this sort of blow up on the level that they do. And, you know, no evidence is recovered or or evidence is just not as helpful or useful is because of things like that. You know what I mean? Like, well, we'll get there. Okay. Okay. I'll shut up. I'll shut up. Okay. So Patty passes away in 2006. So she never gets to find out what happens to her daughter. On September 20th, 2008, an article was published by the Valencia County news bulletin that claimed that the sheriff at the time, uh, Renee Rivera, 
knew what had happened and that he knew who committed the kidnapping. Supposedly, Rivera received information on a couple teens who had actually hit Tara with their truck and panicked. So then they proceeded to murder her and had their parents help cover it all up. In response to this, Rivera stated that until a body is found, he cannot make an arrest. Wow. Can you talk to people at least? Jesus. I don't know. I'm just like, that makes me think it's more of a cover up when you're like, "Mm, well, there's no body. So, you know. It's like, hey, we we have this account that this could have happened. It's like, oh, unless you can find any evidence, even though that's my job, I guess there's nothing I can do about it. Right? Right. Several witnesses believe that the man in the truck resembled uh, a Lawrence Romero Jr. And his father had been the sheriff in charge of the investigation of the initial disappearance. Uh, According to his father was also Lawrence Romero Sr. (laughs) Um, According to local sources, the sheriff's department was known to be corrupt. A witness alleged that they were actually friends with Lawrence Jr., Scott Cunningham and Charlie Hooten. And this group of kids was supposedly heavy into drugs and alcohol and that this uh, witness, this local source, witnessed um, them actually discussing Tara's body at one point. Like he walked in on them talking about her. Uh, Lawrence Romero Sr. died in 2011. His son died a few years prior. So Junior died a few years prior. Senior died in 2011. Wow. Uh, In October 2013, there was a six-person task force that came together to re-examine the case. Of course, nothing new was found. But that same year, a man had also called into the sheriff's department wanting to make a deathbed confession. So his name was Henry Brown. And he was sick and he knew he didn't have a lot of time left. So he wanted to let someone know what he had uh, come across, you know, and what he had experienced. So he had gone to the trailer home of Lawrence Romero Jr. And they had dug out a makeshift basement underneath that trailer home that they would use to like hang out and drink in. He claims that shortly after her disappearance, uh, Brown had actually gone into the basement and found the body of a young woman wrapped in a blue tarp. Brown noted that Romero and two other men discussed burying her in that basement. So he claimed Romero had been waiting for Tara uh, on her bike ride and that they had actually hit her off her bike and grabbed both her and her bike before taking her out into the woods where they proceeded to murder her. Um, This statement has also become one of those pieces of investigation that has mysteriously gone missing in the documents of the file. That's fucked up. But because of this, all these statements are hearsay and allegation. There's no evidence. There's no written statement you know um so it really kind of makes you wonder what's truth there's nothing uh, definitive at all in all of this uh in 2019 the fbi put out a twenty thousand dollar reward for any information that could lead to the discovery of tara Uh, michelle dole her sister continues to keep her sister's case alive in september 2021 the valencia county sheriff's office and the new mexico state police issued a statement that they have a new lead in the case supposedly and that the focus of a sealed warrant for an unknown private residence located within valencia county had been issued however no further details were provided about all of that so um other than that stuff no other evidence has really since been found um, they haven't even found the bike. So it, it's like, where could it have? It's a bright pink bike. Yeah, you know? the fact that they took the bike, there was no evidence of like debris flying off of this bike when it was hit. Right. It seems like yeah. this was premeditated and it was intentional. And like loss of evidence is something that I think should be taken very seriously when there's like big pieces of evidence that keep going missing over the life of a case that is super fucking suspicious. Super fucking suspicious. And I wish there were a way to find out, you know, what happened. But the case is what it is. That it's still unknown to this point in time till till now. That's a that's just a really really sad story. So, you you were right on preparing us for that. Um, You're welcome for the downer. There is a lot of things about that case that definitely seem super uh, sketchy. Uh, I don't, sus. Sus is a good word for it. I mean, I, I'm trying not to use that word because it's been like grilled into my brain from Among Us, but 
it does. It, everything about that seems completely fucking suspicious. And the fact that one of the main suspects is the son of the person who's in charge of the investigation is just red flag after red flag. So I would be very disappointed if I was this this uh, this woman's mother and, you know, the fact that she passed away in the early 2000s without ever knowing and people are still interested in this case and we're still talking about it in 2022, I think is, is a, a good thing that we're still talking about it and keeping that sort of thing alive and maybe at some point the truth will come out. But it's very difficult when there's been no body recovered. You know, the evidence keeps going missing randomly. The bike hasn't even been recovered. So uh, it is very sad. Yeah. But yeah, that is the tale of the disappearance of Tara Calico. Right on. Well, thank you for telling us the tale. Even though it is sad, it is fascinating. So I appreciate it. Yeah. I mean, if anybody ever has any information, please, $20,000 reward at the FBI for you. Yeah, absolutely. Reach out and don't just reach out with a bunch of bullshit like so many people do, because that definitely hurts the case. Um, but yeah. Uh, that's everything we have for episode 215. So thank you for joining us. Sorry that it was a little bit late, but hey, it got here and that is what matters. Uh, if you have a story that you'd like to send us, please email storytime at scarish.com. It could be supernatural, paranormal, coincidental, true crime, extraterrestrial, uh, whatever you would like. And we would love to hear it. We would love to read it on our show. You can also hit us up on our social medias. Facebook is facebook.com slash scarish podcast. Twitter is at scarish pod. Instagram is at scarish podcast. And our website is scarish.com. You can click on contact us, fill out that form. It comes directly to us. Robin, for folks who would like to donate to us, how can they do so? You can go to patreon.com slash scarish podcast. Those are monthly donations. Tiers start at $1. That's four quarters. That is less than a candy bar with tax. Do they put tax on candy bars? Uh, it depends I don't on the know. state you're in, I think. If you go and drink Starbucks, it's way cheaper than a Starbucks. Um, but yeah, um, if you're not into the monthly donation type thing, you can also go to coffee, ko-fi.com slash scarish podcast. And those are one-time donations. All your donations go to helping us uh, kind of keep this podcast going, pay, pay for background expenses, new uh, technology, things like that. Indeed. So thank you so much to everyone who listened, everyone who supports us. We appreciate literally all of you. And that is everything we have. So Robin, why don't you go ahead and sign us out? Keep on creeping on, and we'll talk to you guys later. Bye-bye.